Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to D.G. Wells Books in La Jolla, California. This afternoon, we're honored that noted architectural historian Keith York is here to discuss Frank Lloyd Wright's legacy in San Diego, the Taliesin Apprentices. Uh, we're honored that he is joined today by Frank Lloyd Wright Apprentice, Bill Slatton, sitting right here. He came over from Arizona to attend this. Uh, incident, incidentally, Keith York has published on, on, on the San Diego's post-World post War II modernist architecture, art, design, and craft at modernsandiego.com. It's a brilliant website, by the way. Um, <clears throat> the sons of Frank Lloyd Wright, Lloyd Wright, and John Lloyd Wright, and his and a number of other apprentices, in, including Bill Slatton, uh, came to San Diego and designed an array of projects for clients throughout the region. Bill Slatton worked with Frank Lloyd Wright from 1956 to 59, and came to San Diego and collaborated with a number of number of architects like James Hubble, Harold Abrams, the, the father of my landlord, Clem Abrams, uh, Locke Crane, and, and many others. But at this point, I'm going to sit down and let, uh, and let Keith York take care of this. Thank you, Dennis. Hi, everybody. Hi. We're all having fun, right? Yeah. It's a great, beautiful Sunday to talk about architecture indoors and out. Um, Bill has uh, assisted me on a journey that I would never have known to take had it not been for Heath Fox and the La Jolla Historical Society who embarked with me as a colleague or a, a partner, a collaborator on a show that we put together on, um, I don't want to overstate it or understate it, but Frank Lloyd Wright's sort of impact in San Diego. There's been a lot of urban legends that your next door neighbor's house is by Frank Lloyd Wright. I'm here and I was there to continue to assure everyone that that's not true, but there's a deeper, richer, more interesting story with people like Bill. Um, so I'm gonna go through some slides just to provide some context. We're gonna have a really fun conversation with Bill who you're gonna enjoy meeting. And then we can open it up for a conversation. Does that sound like a plan? Yes. Can everybody out there hear me out? All right, it's panicking. Everybody's panicking? <laughs> All right, there we go. So this, uh, I'll go through these slides quickly, and for those out there, you know, we can always uh, show you these slides at some other time on a bigger screen maybe. But um, this is actually a photograph from uh, the early 30s taken by Bruce Richards um, upon his arrival at Taliesin. Um, and the story I tried to tell at the La Jolla Historical Society or at my website or if I meet you folks um, in any venue is um, there are some really, really, really fascinating homes by other architects that just read about or visited Frank Lloyd Wright projects and took it upon themselves to kind of imbue their work and their career with some of those same aesthetics. Uh, this is a home um, by uh, San Diego architect Lloyd Morocco, uh, La Jolla Robert Mosier uh, very much incorporated a lot of the same ideas and ideals in his work. Um, Henry Hester made a, a few points, a few nods to, to Frank, uh, specifically a house uh, he did in Alvarado Estates, which sunk into the landscape, which very much was a writing principle. Um, Bob Antoline uh, designed a house for his dad as a teenager after reading about Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, a house in Rancho Santa Fe. Uh, people like Ken Kellogg, who some of you may know, but Ken, all the only impact Frank did, Frank Lloyd Wright did on, on Ken Kellogg in person was uh, Ken, as a senior in college, attended a lecture that Frank Lloyd Wright was giving. Uh, but he definitely dedicated his aesthetic uh, life to some of the same principles. Um, part of the other reason I'm, I'm here with you all today is, is uh, Janet Richards, a longtime dear friend of mine, shared with me this picture of her um, when she brought Frank Lloyd Wright to San Diego on one of his visits where he told the city of San Diego they needed a grand theater, a grand palace, a grand opera theater. Um, that didn't come to pass, but boy did he tell sternly San Diegans that they should, and he should be their architect for said project. Um, and just, just to continue to kind of erase some of the urban legends, what Frank Lloyd Wright did do 
is he drew a couple of projects that were never built. Okay, so this is called Cinema for San Diego. Um, and through the partnership with La Jolla Historical Society, I and some Wright scholars learned almost in real time that there's issues with these drawings. The dates and the venues, the address, and who may have actually drawn the rendering are all still up in question. Scholarship still continues on, on Frank Lloyd Wright's work. Um, the dates of both of these, if you're, if you're indoors and you can see in the lower right-hand corner, there are little automobiles. Both of the dates are not aligned with the model year of the car, right? So you can't draw a car that does not yet exist. So the dates of these, both of these cars are, are misaligned. And actually, the, if you believe the drawing date, they predate that actual car coming into existence. So lots of fun, still, still things to learn. Um, Harvey Fergash designed a home in Spring Valley. Someone emailed me the other day that they've been to the house they lived down the street from the house, and I had to be the one to tell them that the house was never actually built. So, so urban legends continue. They're fine. I'm a camp counselor at times telling people that what they did realize was a dream or something very lovely that is in their neighborhood. But uh, this house ended up being built, as Frank Lloyd Wright often did, and Bill might have been a part of this. He always found another client to pay the freight, right? So he drew this for a client in in San Diego who paid him but never built it, he resold the same drawings to a client who did build it. So he doubled, he doubled his money. Um, but you know, this house would have been in, in Spring Valley. Um, but to Bill, right? That's why we're here. Um, the context for which Bill uh, is here with us today was that Frank and his two sons came to San Diego. They designed projects for San Diego. John Lloyd Wright moved to San Diego and spent a good chunk of his life living in Del Mar and actually building, whereas his, his, his brother and his father never uh, actually physically built anything. John Lloyd Wright built a number of projects. Um, Sybris Richards studied with Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, or as we like to call Mr. Wright. Bill? Wright? Mr. Wright? Yes. Uh, was, with, um, was with Mr. Wright uh, upon one of his earliest apprentice programs in the 30s. Locke and Claire Crane were there for a short time on the eve of World War II. Frederick and Marianne Liebhart were there for just a short time, but yet another example of a couple being at Taliesin together. Um, Anne and Bill were there for a short time together and will probably tell us about bugs crawling all over them as they lived on the desert floor. Uh, Vincent Benini was, uh, was there while he still had a young son in L.A., so he was driving from Scottsdale to Los Angeles just to see his newborn son while he was apprenticing. Bill and Ann were there from about 56 to 59, though I've heard rumors that Ann threw up her hands and, and left, but we'll talk about that later. And Dick Belair, who may join us today, he could be a surprise guest, uh, was a friend of Bill and Ann's uh, from, the, from the beginning and was there uh, just shy of uh, the same term that Bill was with them. Um, Here's just a picture of Frank and Lloyd uh, and son, or actually grandson, Eric Lloyd Wright. Um, Lloyd, if you did make it to the Lowe Historical Society show I produced, you could see some of the drawings. He, he designed a, a wonderful house in Mission Valley and a wonderful um, park of apartment buildings and libraries uh, that would have been for UCSD faculty and, and students above uh, La Jolla Shores Beach. Here's a great little picture of John. Since we're in La Jolla, there's a fantastic house uh, by John, uh, the Compton residence. Bruce Richards um, did a number of projects in La Jolla. Uh, key among them is a wonderful house on Calle de Plata uh, as you come into town off of Prospect. Um, these are just pictures. I just want to set the stage before we get into talking to Bill about the meat, but. Here's a great shot of, of, of Locke and his fellow uh, Talius and apprentices eating melon on the grounds. Of course, you know, I've got a lot more pictures from this, but these are the choice pictures, right? Showing real life. Uh, Locke would then go on to design a fabulous house up on the hill on um, Avenida Chamez, which has been for sale for a number of months. Uh, Vincent Benini studied with Frank Lloyd Wright and then moved to a small house in La Jolla Shores and continue to practice, at, uh, including work at UC San Diego. Uh, 
Frederick Liebhardt, and this is a picture of his partner, Gene Weston, designed a fantastic house for themselves on Carrizo Drive, borrowing very much from Frank Lloyd Wright's aesthetics. So this picture is one of my favorites. So Bill Slatton on the left, on his wedding day, or on the eve of your wedding day, on the wedding day. This is Anne, who's in the middle, and Dick on the right is potentially our mystery surprise guest. Anne, could you stand up for a minute? Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Um, and it all starts with an application. And, and while I'm not intending for any of you to try to read this text, Bill had to apply for an apprenticeship. He had to probably pay a small fortune to start, but he had to actually apply and, and talk a little bit about himself. Um, when we were producing the show, one of the things that is often true when I talk to people like Bill is they have no photographic record of this time of their lives, right? So this was a time when film was still expensive, cameras were not in everybody's hands nor in everybody's phone. So we came upon this picture as a frontispiece in a book, and Bill's like, oh, there is a picture of me out there in this book, and we were able to locate the photographer who's now deceased. It's in this book. <laughs> and his daughter still controls the archive, so we were able to license this wonderful photograph, and I asked his daughter, are there any other photographs in the series with this gentleman standing up to the left with his, with his hands folded sternly as if he knew better? Yeah. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, we found this picture, but the key to finding Bill is like finding where's Wallace, like where's Waldo? Bill's forehead is all the way to the left, and he's kind of doing a thing like this, looking at his drafting board, while the photographer is formally capturing the rest of the scene going on around him, as if to say, I just want to get my work done, could you guys just... Leave me alone. But it takes, you know, when we when we work on on these projects together, and when we meet people like Bill, we, we you know things it's it's almost ninety nine percent serendipity. So we find images like that uh, that certainly make us smile, but they certainly begin to tell um, a story that we weren't we weren't even aware of. All right. Well, we'll stop there for a moment while my computer gets caught up. Um, so, Bill, I'm going to share a microphone with you, and we're going to do a little bit of Q&A about these early years. I, I presume you don't remember when this photo session took place, but perhaps you do. I do. Yeah, it was in the summer of uh, 57, and it was at Taliesin North. And uh, just like this time off to take some pictures with the new apprentices. And uh, that's Vern Swabak sitting to his left. He's uh, an architect over in uh, Phoenix. He shot his practice going. The other two people have passed away. Uh, I'm back there somewhere. But this is one of the rare moments where Mr. Wright had a photograph taken with the apprentices. And he usually didn't do that. So anyway, I was fortunate to be there when they were doing it. <coughs> And uh, I'm sorry I didn't have any more, but I don't. Uh, well, that's about all I've got to say about that one. Yeah. So over the time I've known Bill, there's a key story that he threads almost through every one of our conversations about a battery box. So what becomes a career of Bill as Frank Lloyd Wright's welder, so as the summer sun would break down the structures in Scottsdale, Arizona, Bill would swoop in months or years later and rebuild the same structure in steel. Um, not having a great deal of experience in welding at the time when he applied for the apprenticeship, Bill, would you like to share with our folks tonight, today, this afternoon, <laughs> the battery box story? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, I came to Taliesin in October, uh, probably 1956. And uh, on a Saturday, and the first night I was going up to dinner, we were dressed up in suits and everything. And Tom Olson, one of the senior apprentices, was going into town with one of the clients to go to the sympathy or something. 
and he had his car over there, the 50 Ford. And at that time, Shea Boulevard, if you're familiar with Phoenix, that's the end of the pavement. <coughs> so he had about six or eight miles of hard dirt road to travel to get out to Tallahassee. And of course, all the cars took their toll. And the battery had fallen down along with the case down in the floor of his car. And he was feeling he had his, uh, he had his zoot suit on and everything. And I said, well, I saw a welder over there this afternoon. Why don't we come over here and I'll, I'll wear a battery box up. He said, okay. And, and he was a little leery of it. And I said, well, I'll throw a bag over the car door. And so he went <coughs> next door and hid in the root cellar. <laughs> we, we brought all of our roots from the Taliesin from North out in a big semi-truck and stored them in the root cellar so we could have them all year. And so he hid in there and I welded up the battery box. And never thought anymore about it. Went up to dinner. And then Sunday morning, Mr. Wright always had a that's what you heard on the speaker before. He always had a, uh, a speech for us or a question and answer period. And uh, so I was my first breakfast there. And afterwards, I was wandering around out in the desert. And one of the guys came out and was practically calling me to come in. Mr. Wright wanted to see me right away. And I thought, well, you know, it's been a month or two since I interviewed him. I wonder what I did wrong. <laughs> so I went there and he had the drawings spread out for the pavilion. And that's the picture of this one here. And so uh, he asked me if I could weld the structure for the pavilion. Of course, I said yes. I, I would need some guidance. So a week later, all the steel showed up and all the wood, and I worked on that for four months. And we finished it in time for the uh, spring pavilion and the Mrs. Wright's dance. Mr. Wright thought he was having it to show his architectural work. And Mrs. Wright thought she was having it to show her dances. <laughs> and so they did some of both. Uh, but anyway, if I hadn't been for the battery box, I probably would not have done all the other things there. So in the process of time, I, uh, over that winter and the next winter, I rebuilt all the roofs at Taliesin. We tore down the living room and the office and several other uh, several buildings there. And we finished the pavilion, of course. And I did a, oh, a number of little projects, uh, uh, building tables for, a, I guess it was a, some kind of an Easter, or it must have been a fall. He saw some tables in town that he liked. And so we had to make about 80 of those tables. <laughs> it was based on little steel framework. So I built all the steel framework for him. And somebody else, he liked to do them out of little groups of three and different heights and put fruit on them and vegetables and stuff. And... Uh, so over the years, I did a lot of welding there. Uh, Jack Howe was the senior dressman at the time, and he kind of regulated who was in and out of the office because all of the drawings were done at Taliesin. And uh, after I would finish my welding of the uh, pavilion roof, I worked kind of day and night along with John Rattenberry. Uh, this picture here was in John Rattenberry's book. And we became pretty good friends because uh, John was, uh, he did all the electrical work. So he had to, we both had to work at night until late hours to keep up with all the carpenters and stuff. So we became pretty good friends. Um, oh, so I lost my track. <laughs> so, Anyway, uh, oh, people would come to, to pick up, usually if it was a rush project, like uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Michael Todd were going to come out. He had designed a house for them. They were going to stay in a, what they call the sun, and, they used to call it the sun trap. But uh, later on, Ivana stayed there and it became the son-in-law trap. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, they came in there to get workers and, uh, and uh, they would come to get me because they knew I would be in there. And Jack Howell, I could still see him chasing them out of the room with his T-square. He said, Bill's already done his time out there. It's time for him to do drafting, you know. And so I was really on his side, or he was on mine. And we did a project. I think it took like a day or a week, a short time. We uh, People would send letters and telegrams and, what is my project? And Mr. Wright said, oh, it's coming. We're working on it now. Well, it had been a year since he had seen him. We hadn't been working on it, but 
Jackson. Jack, haven't we got this job out in Homestead? I said, let's get on it right now. So myself and about three other guys, we came in and we started working on it. And we started working on it about two weeks before the Christmas time. And then we were going to have a Christmas party for the you know, everything had to be done by hand. We'd draw the outline box and get it ready for the seats. And we didn't have any dimensions on them. We, everything was done by horizontal and vertical grids and very few dimensions. And so we had to put those in Carmine and Ink. And uh, we'd get the sheets as fast as we could get them drawn. Jack would put on the details. He was so fast, it was incredible. Uh, I think we produced that drawing for two or three days. I mean, it's really something. And we did very little. We just kept the sheets ready and we erased a few things and took care of it. But that was Jack. I think he had been a chief justice for 50 years. 58? Yeah. Someone 58? He asked if uh, he, Dick and I, Dick was in the army with me. And his grandfather was the uh, engineer that Mr. Wright had in Chicago in the early days. And his mother, of course, wrote a letter and got us an interview set up. But anyway, Dick and I was asked to stay out there that summer and uh, and tear the drafting room down and rebuild it. So we did. And uh, we'd get up just about daybreak and worked about 11 o'clock. It was about 120 degrees in the summer out there. And then we'd start again in the evening. And so we tore that, all that masonry down and all that stuff. We had a huge bonfire out there one evening and the fire department showed us. And of course, it was just us burning the old roof. And uh, uh, about 10 guys showed up about a week or two before the fellowship came. And they finished painting and putting in the flaps and stuff. But I can't remember uh, how we were able to build that roof. You know, we had a skill saw and a welder. And we had all the lumber. And uh, I don't know how we, the two of us did that. But I, I can't imagine how we did that now. But we did. We got it set up. So I, I, we, uh, Wes Peters, when we, when we were when he was leaving, said, Bill, he said, if you can raise the trellis out here, uh, because when I walk through, I lose my gray hair, and you walk through, you use the black hair. And, and uh, he said, if you can raise that an inch or two on the grafting room, man, I really appreciate it. So I raised it up about two inches. And about the first week, Mr. Wright was walking there, and I was going one way, and he was coming ahead. He pointed out and said, hey, Bill, I see a new weapon been talking together. He could recognize that little two inches. That was the main color screen for there. Um, that's about the only thanks I ever got for that job. <laughs> well, speaking of thanks, I was I was taking a tour of Talios and West recently with my wife. And uh, we were just going on the regular paid admission tour. If you haven't, please make a make a trip out there and uh, so our tour was probably 25 people that had you know certainly an interest in in right and the work and she says you'll never believe what happened the other day and she's telling people um, uh, that don't know her don't know the rest of the story don't know what happened earlier that day even and she says there was this guy and he was just walking like he owned the place through the grounds of Taliesin. He didn't pay admission. He didn't have a name badge on. And lo and behold, he worked here. And they then the story starts describing Mr. Slatton. And I raised my hand. I go, hey, I know this story. And I kind of was able to add a little bit of color uh, to the story. But but Bill had just walked on like, you know, it was, you know, 1956, 7, 8, 9, and, and started pointing out things, and this docent, just, it just blew her mind, and now, months and months later, they've incorporated into the docent script, so they say there are still Talias and apprentices walking around, sometimes pseudo-trespassing on our ground, <laughs> and telling us wonderful stories. Do you remember that day? When you, when, when you just showed up? Yeah, I went out there on purpose to get you some pictures uh, for your meeting. And I think you didn't have them in time or to fit into your program. But I went out there to take a picture of this fountain. Think of that. Uh, I wanted to take some pictures of some of the roofs that I had built. And so that's the reason I went out there that day. I live about 100 miles from there. And I go down there fairly frequently. And... Uh, so I had made arrangements with uh, me, with one of her uh, 
one of the bosses out there. She said, yeah, they'll just come on out and show up and help yourself. Uh, of course, the tourist, tour guides didn't know that. <laughs> so I showed up and walked around like I owned the place. And had a great day. And, you know, I was free to go in the drive room and the room and wherever I wanted to go. And so the old some of them down that very north of the island of Roy, and the only two people were there. And, uh, you know, and Eloise, she did all the sculpture. And, uh, uh, yeah, I remember that day. Sure. <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna come to a show here real or a slide here real quick that shows um, part of part of your projects. Let me get to it here. So this fountain. Here. So talk to us, Bill, about this fountain. Um, if you go to Taliesin West today, this fountain is a prominent feature at the beginning of your tour. My tour actually circled back and we rejoined this fountain, so it bookended my entire time there. Giddy that I knew the story that Bill is about to share with you all about what this is and how it came to be. Well, do you have the former picture of that one? No. Oh, it's in the book. Okay. Well, um, I thought I saw that on one of your pictures. But anyway, uh, Mr. Wright was going down to Tucson to give a talk at the university down there, and he had on a brand new, brand new red suit. And he and Mrs. Wright were going out to get in the car to go, and it was too long. So pretty soon he comes belting out of the car, comes in the office, and fights out about three inches of his brand new suit. And so Mrs. Wright. Hold the mic Mrs. Wright was disgusted with all of that. And uh, so anyway, uh, she wouldn't go with him with that suit cut off. And so I happened to be coming by about that time. He said, Bill, he said, this fountain, he said, I don't like the looks of it much, and it makes too much noise when I'm in the office working. So while I'm going, can you do something about it? And so uh, uh, I went out and I cut the thing down and turned it upside down and studied it a while and put some holes in it. And Arnold Roy was building, he tore out the masonry that was there. And he was busy building that, and so I had to rework the pool and the fountain and all. And Ken, uh, Ken Lockhart was one of the chief people there. And uh, Ken came by, he's one of the senior staff members. He said, Bill, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, I've been looking at this fountain ever since I've been here, and I didn't like the looks of it, I didn't like the way it sounded, so I'm going to change it. Yeah. And I said, oh my God, he said, you'll be out of here, Mr. Wright will come back and have your tail. And so I never, I never told him that Mr. Wright asked me to do it. So, it's been like that ever since. <laughs> I'm going to to say. Yeah. That was was the tree story. there before the, the stone was put in? Mm -hmm. No, that was new. Yeah, this all, everything here was new. This goes to the main theater. This is a this is Mr. Wright's office here, and our pavilion would be back here. But uh, yeah. okay, well that's me here standing up, and this is Dick Lurch. Uh, here. No, not, well, it's either that one or this one. I don't know. One of those. Yeah, it's one of these two. But anyway, that was the pavilion, and that's the last, that was the last truss we were putting up. And you can see we had quite a hands full, and the trusses were just about as big for the drafting room, so we had a, an old pickup that we got down to the level where the drafting room floor was, and uh, I took an old luggage cart from the, they used to use at the airports to bring the luggage from the airplane. That's when you had to walk on and go down and walk in the airplane and go up. And so we had a luggage cart that we used to bring the groceries in. And so I put some big cow catchers in it. went out like that, like the cow catcher of a, of a train. And then, we, and then I built a boom up, and we had a chain hoist up there. And if we picked up the truss in the right place, we could balance it really easy, and one guy could walk it around and move around like that. And uh, that's how we got them located, and he'd be on the other end and put it in place, and I'd weld up some and do the other end. And 
we put two of them up, one at each end and one at the other end, a string line between and line them all up. And uh, so anyway, we could do about, oh, I trust about every two or three days, something like that. That's about how fast we were. <laughs> when we were here the other day, uh, Bill, Bill, Bill arrived and we were just getting kind of acclimated and his daughter was here and we were just talking and, and I, I'm often in awe of people that live in Arizona year round. Even today, right? I was in I was in Tucson three weeks ago, and it was 116 degrees outside. Um, and and so I posed the question to Bill because you can see they're obviously outdoors, right? And he described and maybe you can relive this this description of what it's like, how long or short your workday is, and what that absence of air conditioning does to really hard labor, right? You I mean you were working physically very hard out there in the desert. Really, except for building the drafting room, we were out there in the winter. So it's very pleasant out there in the winter time. Uh, the only place that you uh, met the other guys was when it rained. <laughs> there, there was two places in Tallahassee that didn't leak. But, <laughs> so they'd all be, they'd all be in there uh, keeping out of the rain. My tent was all right, it stayed out there. And uh, uh, it, actually, you know, we, we would take, uh, it was a full work day at four o'clock, we had a, a grand tea. And that's where the picture of my son is uh, when I was taken. And uh, uh, Ed Raymond had been gone and we'd come in for the work. You either work out in the field or in the office, but uh, you didn't need anything. But, we take an hour off for lunch, we'd all be laying out there on these sun boards, getting the sun bath, and be up bright and early, it'd be uh, breakfast at seven, I guess, and we'd all be in there standing by one of the fireplaces getting warm in the drafting room, and uh, we always had breakfast together and lunch and dinner, and a formal dinner on Saturday night, and Sunday breakfast on Sunday, that's where you heard these uh, Mr. Wright talking on these various tapes that you heard earlier, and uh, uh, and we had dinner on Sunday evening, and usually, well, half the time we'd have a movie, but most of the time it'd be a musical evening, and uh, I think we had the first uh, uh, cinemascope lens outside Hollywood, very early on, um, and Baxter, and uh, and Michael Todd was responsible for that. So we had a, a theater at the end, of, a little screen at the end of our theater, and it hinged about that wide. And it was pulled out to take the cinemascope, and when it wasn't, we pulled it back in. And so that was, uh, we always had movies, Mr. Wright loved the movies. And uh, we always had to talk about it Sunday morning, or, or maybe that evening even. Do his little analytical comparison, what he thought about it. 